Welcome to Season 3 of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, a podcast about the Bay Area, technology, and culture. I'm your host, Sunil Rajaraman, and I'm joined by my co-host, Yasha K. Wolf. What's happening, Sunil? I might be getting sick, but I'm not sure. Well, I'm super happy you wore a mask and shared your drink with me today, so thank you. Well... Today, we had a conversation with someone who had just tweeted prior to uh, to joining us that he was afraid of coronavirus. Yeah. And uh, what we learned is that David actually has a pretty big uh, commute. He's coming up every day from San Jose to San Francisco. David Pierce is the uh, senior editor at large at Protocol, which is a relatively new publication uh, covering you know topics at the intersection of, of tech and politics. It's sort of like Politico. Uh, but for but for our community, yeah, same owner. I thought that uh, fascinating conversation in the framing. Like we've we've heard from a handful of the journalists that we've had on on the podcast that they're interested in learning more about protocol. It's been around for a few weeks now, but the thing that I thought was an interesting takeaway is that we see culturally, and they see as as reporters and journalists culturally, that tech has become the equivalent of politics. It's this just monster topic that is involved in everybody's lives now. And I should rephrase a bit. I mean, they are trying to reach a much larger audience, it appears, right? And so one of the, you know, uh, ways that David set the conversation was it's not just, you know, people think of Amazon as if it's an individual making a change. But in fact, it's, you know, Millions hundreds of, of thousands people, of people. Yeah. yeah. Really cool conversation today. Um, David's a, a great writer, a really great writer. Been at Wired, Wall Street Journal, and now responsible for what's happening at Protocol. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's uh, does it feel like it's getting hot here in the closet? This is definitely like prime. I I, I got to stop with the coronavirus jokes. It's not. <laughs> it's just not gonna. History's not gonna look back kindly on on, on your these jokes. types of jokes. Yeah, I kind of agree. But it gets a little warm in this closet towards it's the end toasty. of the day. I mean, you only yeah. closed the door like seven minutes ago, and I'm already. Like, yeah. Minutes. No, totally. Yeah. Well, good. Good call wearing a sweater. Yeah. Really smart decision <laughs> on my part. I'm very good at San Francisco weather now. Hey, we uh, we really appreciate you being here. I um, wanted to ask you, are you from San Francisco? Or are you from the Bay Area? I'm not. So I, I was East Coast forever. Uh, I moved out to San Francisco five years ago, like in two weeks, um, and was in New York before that, and then Virginia and Connecticut and like East Coast forever. Did you, so you grew up in Connecticut? I grew up in Connecticut, yeah. Oh, interesting. Like Greenwich? In Greenwich, Connecticut, yeah. And and as a young kid growing up in Greenwich, probably playing lacrosse, did you say, I really have to move to San Francisco or to California ever? Um, there was a brief time. So it was, was I, right I, about the I lacrosse didn't play piece? lacrosse, <laughs> uh, but I was going to let it slide because there was a time where I did pop my collar on yeah. my polo shirt. So it's like, it's, it's the same thing. Like I basically <laughs> played lacrosse. Uh, it's like metaphorical lacrosse. Uh, but I, I got to this point in New York where it was like, it was really fun. It was really fun to be young and broke and everything's okay over here. Yeah, we're doing fine. But it was, yeah, it was really fun to be young and, and broken in journalism and there was all kinds of interesting stuff and I learned a ton and then just eventually reached this point where it was like, okay, I am ready to be somewhere else. And then at that time it was, I was talking to people at Wired who were like, hey, maybe you should come work with us in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I was, I had just started dating the girl who is now my wife and we were like five months in and I was like, I'm not leaving without her. But I came home one day and was like, so it's so weird. They offered me the job, but they kind of want me to move to California. And she just goes, great, I hate New York, let's go. Wow. So like, okay. It's like, I don't remember inviting you even, but okay, we're going. That doesn't seem like it happens that often for East Coasters. Is she an East Coaster as well? She is an East Coaster. Wow. And so where do you actually move here in, in the Bay Area? Where do you live? So right now I live in San Jose. Uh, we moved to Oakland at first and loved Oakland, but uh, my wife got a job in San Jose and commuting is awful and no one should ever have to do it. And so after two years of driving up and down the 880, she just basically came home one day and was like, I am, I can't anymore. We have to move. Yeah. For the listeners, they should know that we're actually recording in the city of San Francisco right now, Indeed. which yeah. meant that you commuted up here. Yes. So, yeah, that's true. No one should have to commute except me, apparently, <laughs> is, is the way it landed. I, so San Jose is, is big. Where in, where in San Jose exactly? Right downtown, uh, near the, the SAP Center. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I love that area. I grew up in Saratoga, which oh, is not cool. too far away. Saratoga is like the, the cute, sleepy town where we go hiking and wine tasting every once in a while. It's great. I love Saratoga. 
Um, but there is more to the Bay Area than San Francisco. Yeah. I Actually, I don't know that we've had any guests that are from or, or live right now in San Jose. So, w- like, uh, it, was it just work that drew you down to there? To run the tourism department here. Seriously. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, it was basically, it was it was work. And we, we sort of got to this point where we were trying to decide where to move. Mm-hmm. And we knew we had to get closer to her work because the commute was brutal. Um, and so we were sort of looking and trying to decide, well, do we move in the middle and both have medium commutes mm-hmm. uh, or do we just go all the way down and I have a bad commute and she has a really easy commute. Yeah. And what we decided, and this became like very efficient, I, I got on... This sounds ridiculous to say out loud. I feel insane. But I I did a test on Caltrain where I would get on every morning at a different stop to Uh see what it was like and decided that if I get on at San Jose, I can sit on Caltrain, which is life changing because then I can read or work or whatever. If I if we move to Mountain View, I'm going to have to stand on Caltrain every morning. Yeah. And that's the worst. Yeah. So I take I take I take Caltrain every morning and uh, from San Mateo and it's it's standing on that express train. Yeah. Doesn't matter which one you take. Do you but, know there's a train that goes from Petaluma where I live to the to Larkspur to the really? and then you take the ferry. And it's standing room only at Petaluma. Like that's pretty far up north. And it's standing room only. How is the ferry commute? The the ferry commute is is this sort of like beautiful dream for me where you just get to be on a boat every day. Yeah, I mean it it seems really civilized. <laughs> it seems really civilized. It's but it's just public transportation. Like it's your sardines crammed into yeah. a boat. It seems like lots of more uh riders are now using it. Um I don't know if that I suppose that's probably good, but they don't seem to change any of the schedules. It probably means they haven't hit peak uh like ridership. What's the protocol? <laughs> with people riding the, sorry, you see, I'm trying to pivot the conversation here away from commutes. I want to get, I want to get right into the into the meat of stuff. So, how subtle. <laughs> we've had we've had quite a few journalists on uh, lately. So we had Kate Clark from the Information, uh, Corey Weinberg from the Information as well, Elliot Brown from the Wall Street Journal. We've obviously had Mike Isaac, Kara Swisher, and others. And wow, that's good company. It's an honor to be on that list. We've 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 had we've had yeah. some good ones, but this is rather than be self congratulatory about it. Where I was going with this <laughs> is, um, we've also had a number of founders and CEOs, and um, I, I just thirty five, thirty seven episodes of doing this, I've never felt the tension between um, technology operators and technology journalists. It just hasn't felt this way um, mm-hmm. in a long time, and I just wanted to get your take. What what's going on and you know try to to the best of your ability explain both sides of the situation why there's tension between founders Mm -hmm. and journalists right now so i think boy that's a loaded question uh i think the the way i see it now is that i think for a long time a lot of founders got used to getting press only when good things happened Um, i think Mm -hmm. if you work at a company like facebook you know how it works by now. Uh, and if you don't, you've basically had your head in the sand. But like, I think in its honest moments, people at these big tech companies have learned over the years to reckon with sort of the good and the bad, right? But I think if you're starting a company in Silicon Valley, the you either never got press or you got press when you raised a bunch of money. Um, and you got press based on these sort of big, exciting ideas. Um, and I think coming from a place like Wired, which I think is, is sort of constitutionally excited about celebrating good new ideas, that was a cool thing, right? And it sort of worked for everybody. Uh, And now we've gotten to this point where I think journalists are probably slightly delayed in asking hard questions we should have been asking all along. Um, I think in some ways we maybe have swung that pendulum a little bit too far. Like I think there are interesting things happening that don't get talked about because they're not scary. And I think that the easy thing to talk about right now is the scary stuff because there's lots of it and we spent so long not talking about it. And so I think that relationship and it, it flipped so fast too. It wasn't like it wasn't like there was this sort of gradual change as all these companies got bigger and the industry got bigger. Like there was literally like a day. <laughs> like Cambridge Analytica Day flipped the narrative. It all happened oh, all at once. And I think uh and like it, that's that's obviously a simplification, but like mm. in a really real way, like the the world sort of changed about how we think about tech that day. Yeah. Um and I think that it was just so jarring that I think these these founders specifically who I, I would argue honestly in some ways didn't really understand what the press does and that's fine that's not their job uh, had 
they just this tension got so big so fast that nobody really had time to think about it. I totally buy Cambridge Analytica as a like a unique point in time where that like literally the zeitgeist changed. Yeah. And and I, I just never really connected it through into journalism and kind of tech founders. I think that's a really astute time frame. We picked the date that it happened here, Sunil. Nice job. <laughs> yeah. David. yeah, yeah. This is uh this is that's a that's a really really good insight. And you know, I I, I remember when that story broke as well and uh, obviously, you know, um, very jarring to see. You know, and I, the there was the it was was the guy's name Christopher Wiley? Was that mm-hmm the the whistleblower or whatever uh, and watching him like kind of the video and just uh, everything it was kind of like a full multimedia blitz of yeah. that story for several days yeah there and there have been patterns that have, I guess there have always been patterns around like the story that broke from the person inside and the great journalist that did it but it feels a lot more uh, focused on tech since then we've seen Uber stories we've seen stories about Airbnb we've seen stories about WeWork we just had Ellie Brown in here not too long ago and yeah I mean and I, I do think part of it is it was I'm I wonder often actually if without Cambridge Analytica that things would have changed this way too because to your point a big part of what happened also is that a lot of companies got really big mm-hmm. uh, and got really important and sort of changed in big ways and I think Uber is actually an interesting example too where Uber went from being this sort of small, interesting tech thing to like being on the streets of your city where you live. And I think when when that happens, it just feels different and you start to cover it differently. And they had issues with governments that became a problem. And as these things started to come out like that, their narrative, I think, changed a little more slowly. Yeah. Um, And maybe the whole narrative would have changed a little more slowly if it hadn't been for this sort of big, obvious Cambridge Analytica thing. But yeah, I mean, I really do believe that 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 changed a lot of people's minds all at once. Was it um, was it all the East Coast reporters that showed up on the West Coast that helped Cambridge Analytica be the story that it was and the break of the stories? Right, like you all were East us, Coast like, reporter, cynical, yeah, mean New Yorkers. Is there something about that? Is, is there a difference between uh, reporters who grew up and kind of worked on the East Coast and the Wall Street Journal, maybe, or in other places, versus somebody who grew up in tech journalism? It's an interesting question. I mean, I think. I don't know, honestly, there's probably something to that. Um, But I also think there's something to, it goes both ways, right? Like there's, what happened was more tech, more people started covering tech Mm -hmm. and came with different perspectives and thought about it differently. And people who weren't sort of schooled in why tech was cool and exciting and weren't even necessarily around or interested when tech was cool and exciting, when like every new computer was this big, amazing deal, you're just naturally gonna approach tech differently. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, all those tech companies started doing such big, different, important things that they the, the they start having you know energy company conversations and they start having car company conversations instead of just look at this cool technology. Yeah, and it all kind of happened at once. I'm curious. So we talked a little bit about Cambridge Analytica, WeWork, et cetera. But if in in your journalist text threads or you know wherever you you follow what you follow, what what to you is a prototypical example of how accountability journalism should work? Is there a story that you followed that maybe not many people followed that, okay, this is how it should work? Um, well, I think the the example that immediately comes to mind is one that a lot of people followed, but is, is frankly the way Mike Isaac covered Uber, um, which is to me like the, the master class of how to tell a story like that, where it was it was fair and honest and straightforward and he was never wrong and like just told the story as it was. And it was, I think an an easy thing to do in covering something like that is to sort of decide as a reporter that this thing is bad and treat it as such and start taking cheap shots. And like that story never did that. It was just down the middle and honest and true. And it happened to be that a bunch of really bad things were going on. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, and it got to the point where the, the, weight of the evidence was just so significant that it's like there's no other conclusion to draw and that to me is like perfect reporting he is really excellent and uh and you know the book is excellent and yeah that's yeah, a really good book people uh people people point to him as well if you had to think of the counterpoint where you think of god i wish that story never came out because it makes us as a community lose credibility is there is there one you can think of i know that you know, it's not "quote unquote" cool calling out your fellow professionals, but I'll call out Yasha right now. I mean, thanks. It's kind of he's an okay marketer. But yeah, he's, he's all right. <laughs> he's reachable. <laughs> I do think, uh, but but I think where um, where I would go with this too is like, are there some softballs that were just like that's such an egregious softball 
it was tossed out there that it's doing a, a disservice to us as journalists. Sure. I think I'm guilty of a lot of that, honestly, um, over the course of my career. I think it's it's tempting. And I'm trying to come up with a good example. I will, I will eventually think of one, and I'll, I'll just interrupt you randomly later in this podcast <laughs> to tell you about it. But I think the, the mistake that I've made, probably more than any other, is buying into uh, the, the sort of future case of an idea. Um, oh, Andy Rubin, here's a perfect example. <laughs> I wrote about Andy Rubin when Essential started. Um, yeah. And Andy Rubin was the creator of Android. He raised a lot of money. He's very convincing when you talk to him in person. And so I wrote this story basically saying, Andy Rubin is gonna win, ignoring so many things. <laughs> like, thank God there are better reporters than I am out there figuring out what he was actually doing and what was going on. But I even ignored these basic things like it, getting into the smartphone market is very hard. And the, the you know, market for smart home things is a mess. Uh, and instead I bought into like, oh, if this thing works, it could be amazing. And I feel like that, I see a lot of that in tech and I've been guilty of that many times. And I feel like that to me is like, I, I, I talk a lot about now thinking about this stuff, trying to think about like ground truths. It's like, what is, what is real right now? The rest of it is nonsense. Have you ever been in a situation where you you felt like, okay, I, you know, I have this tip, there's a story that I can write, but I am afraid about the ramifications, like it could jeopardize the the future of a source or or something like that. Do you find yourself in that situation ever? Sure. Um yeah, I mean I think with with sources it's it's there's you're constantly playing that game a little bit. Like you don't wanna you don't wanna burn bridges, you don't wanna cause people trouble that you don't need to cause them. You don't want to get people fired. Um, yeah, I mean that—that's—that's that's part of the game in reporting in a lot of ways. Or, or the other way where somebody just has so much power within the ecosystem that you know, um, if you if you publish a story, then you're you're blackballed in some way or something like that from the VC community or something. I don't know. I, I'm just making that up. But yeah, I mean, I think my my background. I've done less of that stuff, honestly. Um, like the 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 easiest example of that, given a lot of the stuff that I've done in the past, is like, um, it sounds so low stakes, but like giving an Apple product a bad review is is a thing people worry a lot about, right? Because mm -hmm. getting access to Apple products and Apple executives is one great shortcut to getting a lot of people to read your work. Um, and and there is this constant fear that if I Right, that the Apple TV sucks, which I did, and it does. Uh, am I? Am I going to? I love to... the Apple TV. Are you kidding? <laughs> really? Yeah, I love it. Wow. Yeah, it's twice as expensive and everything else, and it doesn't work as well. Yeah. It's like, what, what's not to like? <laughs> uh, but so that's that's a thing that we we I've I've gone back and forth on a lot, and and eventually, like you've I've my skin has thickened on that stuff a lot, and I've just sort of come to the idea that like if that happens, so be it. I can keep doing my job, but also. To Apple's credit, that has never happened. I've been saying the Apple TV sucks for a really long time, and they keep talking to me about it. So, we um, before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about some experiences that you had when you were in New York, um, working with other reporters, some of which that are out here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Uh, we've had a, quite a few different journalists on the podcast, and many of them, after we stopped recording, were like, "Oh, cool, you're going to talk to David." I'm really curious about what's happening with protocol. Oh, that's nice. So, so want to talk a little bit about that? But like, what what was it like being in a kind of around a bunch of beat reporters in the Wall Street Journal. Oh, it's the best, the best. Um, I have so much envy and respect for people who are really great beat reporters, for people who just, and I got to watch them do it. Like the, I was there when when the, the Google reporter changed a couple of times at the Journal and mm -hmm. watching somebody who was a great beat reporter sit down and say, I am going to learn Google is just the most fascinating thing. And the the, the way that you you know you send emails and you sort of make lists of who to talk to and you draw these like circles of power and figure out the org chart and like it seems like a crime scene oh I mean it's incredible you really are you're like one small step away from like yarn on the wall <laughs> putting stories together um but it, it's it was really remarkable to watch and there are people at the journal who've been covering the same company in the same industry for decades and it's like to have that knowledge on staff, or just in the world out there, like telling you what's going on is incredible. Like those people know the companies better than the people who run those companies. It's mm -hmm. amazing. If you were to pick between the Wall Street Journal, uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, who has the best reporters right now? Oh, I'm not answering that question. You have to answer. Uh, the Journal. Okay. Good okay. answer. Yeah. 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 Come on. Decisive. 
He went really quickly from not answering that Dude, question yeah. to well, exactly. if you're going to make me answer, it was the, the pressure. The answer was I have a really, yeah. I have a piercing glare, so it, it happened. <laughs> is that what it is? I don't know, Sunil. <laughs> I'm I, like I'm now. I feel uh, insecure because you called me a mediocre marketer. I, I know. Wow. <laughs> I didn't actually mean that. I was trying to <laughs> to make a point. I, I get was, it. I was I trying to it. make. I was trying to create a safe space for him to. <laughs> yeah, no, no. You know what I was trying. You know what? Yeah, is there it. a word for that? Yeah. What's the word for that? Uh, stepping on other people to make other people feel comfortable. <sighs> I'm just kidding, Sunil. I think it's called negging. <laughs> I think we need. I think we need a little group therapy in here. Let's <laughs> let's let's have a side conversation about that. But we're uh, um, okay. So so protocol. Yeah. What what's going on? Tell us you know, relatively new entrant. And I mean, like publishing, I mean, tough business. Yeah. Like, it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> so it turns out, how do you, uh, you know, how, like what's, what's the thought process? What's the audience that you're hoping to reach? Like what, you know? Sure. So basically, okay. So the, the, the pitch for protocol was essentially that, uh, the way that Politico approaches the government, which is to take this thing that is perceived as this sort of giant, monolithic, impossible to understand thing that is crucially important to everybody's life, but is just like the government. Uh, that's what tech is now for people, right? Like tech mm -hmm. affects everybody. But we think about tech as, you, you either think about tech as Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey and like their playhouses, or as these giant, trillion dollar monolithic companies. And it's like, people say Amazon did, like Amazon doesn't do anything. A million people work at Amazon. Amazon doesn't do anything. Uh, and so what I've been saying to people a lot is like, the belief that we have at Protocol is that the future is just decided by people sitting in rooms arguing about stuff. Uh, and we wanna cover like that. We wanna talk about tech that way. So I think the world doesn't need more iPhone reviews or information about how to use your smartphone or the new features that are coming out. But I think understanding the way that the tech world works and then on the flip side how what happens here percolates out into the rest of the world uh is is a huge story and i think one that we're really excited about telling and part of that is like robert albritton who owns us always talks about this like mythical person i don't know if this is a real person or not but he always talks about like if you're a healthcare executive in kansas city that's who he always talks about you know that like amazon is doing healthcare stuff and you know that Google bought Fitbit, but the DOJ doesn't like it. And you know that um, Apple is doing work with insurance companies to share Apple Watch data. You know all this is happening, but you don't know what it means to your business. You don't know whether you, any of it matters. You don't know whether you should be investing to fight it or trying to partner with them or trying to buy a startup to compete with them or whatever that like understanding how to be in this world, which increasingly affects everybody, is impossible. And we want to help. How many people are working on protocol right now? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, 30 some? Did you raise, Boy, I hope that's did, right. <laughs> did you raise any <laughs> no. uh, money to no. start the publication? Uh, it so is, we, we are totally owned by Robert Albritton, who also mm -hmm. owns Politico and lots 30 of other 30 people things. is no joke. Even 20 is no joke in the publishing world. No joke. So Neil ran Bold Italic for many years. He didn't have 20 people there, right? No, it was, I mean, we, we had to, I mean, we acquired the assets from Gannett and it was, you know, like it was all freelance staff. We just had yeah. to kind of keep it alive. That's a that's a monster investment. Yeah, I people. mean, this is this is one thing that's been really fun and really exciting about this whole project is is Robert in particular is a big believer in like let's give this its full chance, mm -hmm. um, and and he he likes to try a lot of things and fail really fast and move on and like if the thing that fails fast is me, then like I probably won't have this job for long. Well, I won't <laughs> I won't ask the question as to whether you know you think it'll succeed or not because obviously you think it will, otherwise you wouldn't be working on it. But. Um, but tell me about the written, you know, like just written in general, like, uh, so, you know, audience attention spans shortening. One thing that we experienced at Bold Italic is we couldn't get people to read for more than 30 seconds an article, whatever the number was, right? A couple minutes. And then they bounce to other publications. Is, is the written format viable? And like, if so, why, like, what are you seeing? Just curious. I mean, yes, I think the, the written word is, is viable. And I think, uh, what I have seen everywhere I've worked really has been uh, that when you're when you're doing something right is when your best stuff is your most successful stuff. And so that's like that's the thing we've been talking about a lot is I think to me like having the same 500 word news story as everybody else is a waste of time. Right. Like there there are there are a thousand places that are all covering the new YouTube feature that launched today. I'm just assuming there was one and I'm assuming everybody covered it. Uh, what what is 
what is really viable is different things and new things. And I think that the appetite for that never goes away. But one thing that has been super exciting to me that I would never in a million years have expected is how much email is a thing. Mm. Like I came into this kind of thinking email was a fad and newsletters are, are neat and whatever, but we're all going to move on because, you know, young people don't use email. But we, we went around and talked to all these people who are in our core audience, which is basically like anybody who is sort of has a vested interest in tech. So it's like business leaders and people who work at tech companies and regulators and all that stuff. And we asked all of them, like, how do you get your news? And everybody's first answer is email. Like I wake up in the morning, I have the three email newsletters that I like, and that's where I start. Yeah. Hunter Walk said that when he was here. I mean, like, I think it's a very real thing. There, we have this very high expectation as consumers that we're going to get a great experience from where we go because we've been trained by like Netflix and Spotify that that's what's going to happen. Right. And it just doesn't. It's like garbage most places. But I can tell somebody exactly what I want to get by subscribing to their newsletter if their newsletter is about whatever the thing is that my kind of micro topic is that I care about. I like. I fundamentally believe email is important because it's the filter that a consumer has said. I'm willing to invest some time. There's a lot of crap that's in email too, but if somebody subscribes to you, they're telling you, I've made that decision. Yeah, well, and I remember I, I was talking to uh, Rahul, the CEO of Superhuman a while ago, and Superhuman's the email client. And I asked him, like, why, why email? Who's gonna pay you $30 a month for an email client? And he said, basically, that what he realized is that the more powerful you get, the more your job is just to send and receive emails, <laughs> and that, that what most people do in business is just sit in their email inbox all day and like occasionally make a slide deck about the things that were yeah. in their inbox. And so it's just, that's, <coughs> that's yeah. just the place people already are. And being able to be there is actually really powerful in a way I totally did not anticipate. Fascinating. So do you have to hire different kinds of reporters if email becomes a really important part of the way that you get your content out? Probably. I mean, it's it's a really different thing. I'm I'm writing our, our daily morning newsletter, and it is a really different muscle than mm -hmm. I expected. Um, like, I'm, I'm used to writing, you know, either newspaper columns or, like, long magazine features and, and writing a sort of breezy email that is pleasant to read when you first wake up in the morning and are, like, blearily brushing your teeth is a totally different skill. Um, it's been really fun to try and learn, but I think – it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely, it's a different thing for sure. I'm pretty bullish on audio for a similar reason. I mean, so email, you know, of course, superhuman, and then now we're seeing Substack and some other interesting mm -hmm. companies, you know, pop up there. But what, what audio kind of, it, it feels like it's another open protocol. Anybody can create, anybody can do stuff. And we all have AirPods on in the morning. And so in the same way that, you know, you read newsletter, everybody's going to have, listen to something in the morning. I agree. People keep talking about the the podcast bubble, and I don't I don't buy that at all. I yeah. think podcasts are going to be enormous for a long time. Do you have AirPods, Yasha? I do. Pro or you? pro or regular? I actually so for Valentine's Day, my wife gave me a pair of AirPod Pros. Oh, I'm jealous. Right for Valentine's Day, that's how that's romantic for us. <laughs> that's very nice. Uh, this is not a coronavirus joke, but this is a. Uh, I'm afraid that like there's going to be some weird bacteria that comes up with with these things because they're disgusting after like a week. Yeah, they they are pretty gross. I actually think the like the culture of wearing things in your ears all the time is also gross in a very different way. It's like it just seems disrespectful to me. So I, I, like I, I have, I have a question on this front. Do you guys, if you're wearing your AirPods and you go into like a coffee shop to order something, do you take your AirPods out, order, and then put them back in? I take them off. I yeah, hundred percent. Okay, them off. I do too. But yeah. I feel like increasingly I yeah. see people not doing so, and they're not necessarily listening to anything. So it's not like right. they're distracted. They just you just leave your headphones on, and it is the strangest thing to me, but I feel like we're about six weeks away from it being totally normal and everybody just has I, headphones on 24 seven. I was in a meeting not too long ago, like a few weeks ago, important meeting in the context of the work that I work in. And literally somebody came in and had their earpods in and I was like, oh, wait until you're done with your call or whatever it is that you're listening to. And they're like, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm not listening to anything. I was well, like, what are you doing with this? Yeah. And they left them in the entire meeting. It's like, what's going that on? That is like an, a big plus of having them in is like you just run into somebody on the street. You know, you're kind of like, uh, you know, I can't, can't talk right now on a call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just like point to your ear. and If talking. I did that to you, I was I was actually on a call. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so how do you, like, how do you think about 30 people, if it's 20 or 30 people, whatever the number is, that's a lot of number of people that you're hiring. Where are you hiring them? They're all here in the Bay Area. Are they all over the place? Like where, how do you go about that? It's been a little bit all over the place and I think will be sort of increasingly all over the place over time. Um, we're more, let's see, I think we're more in San Francisco than anywhere else. And then probably second New York 
and then we have people sort of sprinkled all over. We have London and Portland and a handful of other places. Okay. But uh, I mean, I think for us, part of the belief is that tech is a story that isn't just about Silicon Valley and New York and DC. And it's a story about, you know, China and Salt Lake City and Kansas City and Europe. And like, I think the only way to really cover those things is to have people there. So mm -hmm. I think we will probably always have a lot of people in San Francisco and New York because there's just a lot going on and there are a lot of good journalists in those places. But I think the the bigger and sort of broader we get to be and think, the more we will want to be in sort of unusual places where tech typically mm -hmm. is not. We know you're uh, early in protocol days, but what is the, the story that, I don't know, is the most successful or you're most, the quote unquote, most known for, but for listeners who want to know where to start, what's the what's the story you would recommend? Sure, so I think that the first story that we did that really kind of hit and, and like went a lot of places was uh, Lauren Hepler, a reporter on our team, wrote about the tech buses. Um, and it, it winds up being this sort of great story about how San Francisco has spread and how the tech industry has sort of moved people further and further out as the city has gotten more complicated. So now you have yeah. buses that are going like all the way out into the Central Valley to pick up tech workers because people can't afford to live close enough or there just aren't places to live. And so it's it was this genius idea. Like we all, when Lauren pitched this story, we're kind of like, you just want to write about buses? But it turned into this, this like amazing story about how tech has changed San Francisco and it, it and moved it out and it's become more complicated and it's harder to sort of make it one community now. And yet these buses are trying to just drag everybody back into the middle. So that would be, that's my favorite story we've done so far. Looking toward the end of the, and so we're, we're, uh, Yasha is looking like he's itching to ask the social, the social media question <laughs> in, in like a minute here, but I'm, I always stop him like with one or two random questions and then he has another random question and these these things drag on sorry this is the audio this is the problem with the audio format it's no okay. editors i got nowhere to go no editors exactly <laughs> um, <laughs> all right so so looking looking toward you know 2020 is already off to a pretty interesting start um, <laughs> that is an understatement yeah. so let's let's look toward the end of 2020 sure um when we all what, have coronavirus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's the state of things? You know, do we, you know, and kind of just along any dimension, I mean, with, with a focus on tech, but does Airbnb IPO, um, how is the market doing? You know, who who is who is president, if you're willing to answer that? And I assume gotten so big that they bought Google. <laughs> yeah, like what's what's happening here? I mean, like give, give us a few takes that you have for this year. This is, you're going to hate this answer, uh, but... I, anyone who can possibly confidently answer any of those questions is lying. Uh, and I feel like it, we've been in this place where it's easy to sort of day to day think that things are crazy, but in the even slightly longer run, most things tend to be fairly normal. Right now, it doesn't feel like that. Like this year was always going to be nuts because we have an election that's going to be very weird and we have antitrust stuff happening that's complicated and we have all kinds of regulatory stuff that's complicated and privacy laws and like I, a lot of things are going to be different 12 months from now than they are now but then you throw in this coronavirus thing which uh is terrifying and who knows like it could be nothing or literally we could all get sick and like who knows so i feel like we're we're at a place kind of unlike any i can remember in the last several years where it, it genuinely feels like making calls about where we're going to be even in six months seems ridiculous. Who do you want to win the presidential election? Yeah, I'm not answering that question. <sighs> Who do you yeah, want to win the Democratic primary? I'm also not answering he can, that can He can get into trouble for that. The ABC guy got that got fired for that, right, the other This day. is a breaking news podcast, Neil. We have to keep pushing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's... That was terrible, by the way. That I, I will happily... Yeah, yeah, I will yeah, happily yeah. get in trouble for saying that ABC was ridiculous to suspend him for doing that. That was pretty bad. People yeah. should stand up for their reporters. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, so so let's just I, since the we're, we're recording this after let's just talk about the San, like the Sanders thing for just a second and the I'm not I'm, I'm not looking for an endorsement the Sanders here. thing being about the RSU tax yes yeah holy what the heck I 100 percent uh, have you read about, you've cleared a little bit yeah. yeah okay so just for for our listeners who are, are hearing this for the first time so this is if you're a startup employee in the Bay Area that makes uh, 130k or or north, which you know is barely a living wage here, and is 170 thousand dollars, 117 thousand dollars in San Francisco is below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. 
you would, if you worked for a startup company, uh, and so the whole uh, allure is, you know, if you get stock options, they vest over a period of four years, you would pay taxes against the vested portion of those stock options, whether they're worth nothing or, you know, potentially worth a lot. And by the way, most startups end up failing, um, you know, and so you would pay for pay taxes on them as they vest, which is unbelievable. <laughs> it just seems like it, it, it you know, I don't know why he would introduce that bill. That's what happens when your grandparents start making policy, Sunil. <laughs> and so, and so, actually, what I where I'm going with this is, you know, I think what I'm seeing, at least in in social circles, and I, I too, uh, I would never state a, a candidate preference or anything like that, other than saying that I think Trump's, you know, morally reprehensible on every single level. That it's almost unbelievable. But wait a minute, you won't say who you're going to vote for. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, we don't know who's going to win the primary. Yeah. And who are you voting for in the primary? I mean, I'm a Buttigieg guy. Okay. I I, I like Buttigieg. I think he's I think he's great. Yeah. A lot of people think he's smarmy and don't like him. I don't understand that. Um, anyway, I did okay. the Washington Post poll. Did you do that one? Where it, you, no. You uh, put all your you selected. It's like a uh, whatever the BuzzFeed quiz, but on the Washington Post and see where you lined up with the candidates oh, that's from their fun. policies. I like and that. I, like Klobuchar is where I matched against. I, you know, I think Klobuchar is great. I think, look, at the end of the day, you're going to ultimately have to back anyone who comes so out of there. But no editor is on podcast. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a real journalist. But the, uh, um, but he's not really making an effort to win friends here at yeah, all. I agree. Uh, like he has just gone out of his way to, you know. And so, what's your, what's your whole take on the, you know, on the people like who are kind of like me? We know Trump is just horrendous uh, on every level, but then you look at the Sanders thing and how that's going to play out, and you're all you're just unsure about what he introduces to the whole geopolitical mix and all of that. Like, is that a thing? Like, what's yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I I've sensed this from people for months now, and I think as it becomes, it seems fairly clear that that Bernie is now the sort of overwhelming favorite to be the nominee. Uh, and if that's the case, I've heard from a lot of people in in the Valley who are nervous about that um and it, it just because it feels it is sort of an unknown and i think honestly I, I i tend to agree that this the his idea about the tax is just not feasible really like it just doesn't I, it, I it actually penalizes you know the poorer tech workers right like the quote-unquote poorer tech workers and it makes it so that people are not going to want to work for startups which which i think i mean in some ways I, i've heard some people argue that that's the goal um and I'm not necessarily sure that I, I buy that. Honestly, like I think we we have a long way to go before we figure this out. Bernie's has a rally in San Jose on Sunday, uh, and I'm very curious to know how that's going to go. Because, Are you going? Uh, I will go. Mm -hmm. uh, I have I have a newsletter to write for Monday, and I feel like that's <laughs> going to be it's going to be good fodder for it. But do you need me to make you a sign to carry? <laughs> <laughs> just like, can it just say like Bernie say something interesting so I can put it in right. my newsletter? Can you please explain this position, <laughs> please? Um, it's going to be a really interesting year regardless. I mean, this is, I mean, it feels like every year is this. Then uh, the, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is, is actually what you mentioned this, this whole, like over a long period of time, everything, there's some sense of, of normalcy, but it feels like we're being tugged up and down. Um, and I don't know if that's because stuff is actually happening or because of the way that reporting has changed. But I mean, I thought, I remember being so anxious that we were going to go to a war with Iran, like three weeks ago, I was sitting in our minivan, just kind of like stressed out. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then now I'm stressed out in the, the same minivan worried about coronavirus. Like what's like, what's this, what's going on here? Like, is that media driven? Is that like, what can you explain? Like, it's tough. I, I mean, I think the, the way I've come to see it in my own life is essentially just sort of sensory overload. Um, that it's, and I think it's, it's in part, I mean, you think about like, you know, Russian disinformation, which is not what accounts for everything, obviously, but like the, the tactic is, is very much to just confuse you so intensely that you eventually just go, I don't know what to believe and just kind of throw up your hands. Mm -hmm. And it feels like if you, if you spend enough time on the internet, you inevitably end up there anyway, <laughs> where like you can be, you can be on Twitter where a bunch of smart people, you know, are saying radically different things about the same thing. And the news does seem to change. And I think I think in general, people who assume the worst of the media are wrong and self-serving. But I, I do think that it is it's easy as a reporter to fall into the trap of 
chasing everything. And because we have Twitter and it's so easy to publish, to publish everything and, and to not sort of take time to do the full thing in as full and nuanced a way as it deserves. And so I think we wind up in this place where you can just run in a thousand directions all the time. And it's just, it's just a terrifying place to be as a consumer. But like I spend all of my time reading about this stuff and I still feel like at the end of the day, I'm still, I'm spinning in a hundred different directions. Everybody just needs their own editor. That'd be um, nice. Is right? that the, is that the takeaway from this conversation? I kind of feel like it is. The, like editors are applicable everywhere, like everywhere. It's true. Well, and it, we've been thinking about this a lot too, where it's like the, you think about the social platforms who are trying to figure out sort of how to say what's true and what isn't. Um, and like, do we put a, do we put a flag at the bottom of this post that says this is probably a lie or does it, should it be a different color? And it's like, we're still in this place where as people, we just don't have the tools to process the stuff that we're being asked to process. And it's like the, I don't know, I, I try to sort of keep in mind all of the things that people say that are true, which is like in the aggregate, things like crime are down and quality of life is up over time. And it's like, we just think that's different because we hear about it all now. Yeah. And the, to remember that like what I'm reading is not, everything all yeah. the time is very important, but it's so hard to remember that when you're just sitting there scrolling through a thousand different things all at the same time. Everything's horrible. I'm going to ask you the question and then I'm going to let you think about it. I'm, gonna tell I'm you not going to interrupt you. This crazy stat that I learned about a week ago. Um, but the question is, and I'll let you prep on it a little bit, um, as the editor on the social networks that you spend your time, who are the individuals or the organizations that you recommend as follows to the listeners? And, and in advance of that, um, I was in this meeting about a week and a half ago, and I was talking to a person who is a um, sociologist and a PhD in sociology, and they've been tracking over the course of the last 40 years one statistic, and the statistic was when parents say that they're comfortable letting their kids go to the corner store by themselves. And this is like the the kind of measure that helps people understand how safe people feel. Right. And over the course of the last 40 years, it's changed from six years old. Right. Your parents, maybe when we were younger, maybe Sydney, I'm the oldest. So my parents were comfortable. I think I remember being like six, seven and eight, being able to go to the store by myself. Now, today, parents don't let their kids go to the corner store on average until they're 12 or 13. Wow. Right. And, and it kind of matches what we're talking about here, where over the course of the last 30, 40 years, crime is declining, quality of life is increasing. Yet we have so much access to the stuff that feels like everything is falling apart that is having these kind of very strange uh, impacts into the way that we're raising kids and society and connections that we have. It's a it's a crazy, crazy time. Well, it's tricky, though, right, because I think the, the flip side of that is I think people who go on these like fad caveman diets where they're like every, they knew what they were doing. 400 years ago. It's like, no, they died at 21, 400 years ago. Like they didn't know what they were doing. And then they invented fire and shoes and everything got much better. Like vaccines turn out to be good. It, like who knew? But then, so it's like, is, is the problem that we know, we think we know too much now, or we didn't know enough then. And I feel like you can sort of talk yourself in any direction you want. Like, was the world always scary and we didn't know, or are we making the world out to be scarier than it is? And I feel like squaring those two things as a as a reporter, but also just as a person yeah. is a real challenge. We need an editor to uh, give us the <laughs> recommendations on uh, who we need to follow. Okay. Um, my favorite Twitter follows. Uh, can I like cheat on this a little bit? Maybe. Okay. Um, so Medium started this publication a year ago, like right now, a year ago called One Zero. Uh, and they hired a bunch of really great tech reporters and they're all very good at Twitter. Actually, they're all really good at tweeting one zero stories. So anytime one zero publishes anything, I see like 37 tweets about it in my timeline. Uh, but they're all very good, like Sarah Emerson and Will Aremis and Dave Gerkorn, like all those guys, that whole one zero is great. And, and they're all really good at Twitter. Um, I recently quit Instagram, so I actually don't have a great Instagram answer oh. anymore. Um, but I used to like earth pics just because it made me happy. Yeah. It's like a nice sort of quiet photo of like a beach in Bali a couple of times a day. It just felt wonderful. Um, I want to close out with asking you, uh, okay, I want to I have a product idea. We, we talked about this before the, uh, before we, before we started recording. Okay. So we all remember, or at least if we're old enough, am I hot or not for our, for the, <laughs> and it was started by this guy, James Hong, who good guy, really, mm -hmm. really smart, thoughtful guy. Okay. So we're going to do this, but 
it's like, we got to come up with, am I an asshole, but in real life or not. Right. And you show somebody's maybe it should just be like, are they better or worse than they are on the internet in real life? That's right. That's, and there's your version of hot show their not. Twitter profile photo and like IRL and online. <laughs> and, <laughs> where where and should you, you interact rate, with them? Yeah. Where should you interact with them? What would you rate them? Mm -hmm. And we get, uh, what thoughts? I, I have found most people are much better in person than they are online. Um, but I love this idea. And I would, I would also like to be able to tell people, I think you should be able to see the results for yourself, including specific people and what they think about you. Any, oh. any specific people that, you know, you want... uh, well, I mean, I, I'll just give you the same <laughs> example I gave you, uh, which is, which is Matt Honan who, uh, works at Buzzfeed yep. and is, is, I mean, just not, he's the worst on Twitter. If I'm being, if, if we're all being honest <laughs> with each other. Um, and I think a lot of reporters are like this. It's just fun to be sort of a grumpy and, and just kind of a jackass on Twitter. But Matt Honan is the kindest, nicest, most decent person like who lives on earth. And it was so jarring the first time I met him because I had only followed him on Twitter. And so I expected this sort of like surly, like grizzled, you know, type. And he just like is biking with his dog in a backpack being wonderful. And it's like, so a two online, a 10 in real life. <laughs> uh, so, yes, absolutely. We go. Yes. We'll just put that, his picture up and start I it. I think you got something going here. <laughs> you you want to put out your PayPal or something so people can just give you a little angel investment? Oh, that's a good idea. It's not isn't that GoFundMe or I can start a <laughs> so GoFundMe? It's only when you get, get, only when you get sick. So. Oh, oops. <laughs> hey, this has been a lot of fun today. Thank you for spending time this afternoon. Thanks for us. having me. This was great. I, I, for the life of me, I don't understand why everybody won't just say who they're going to vote for and who they're going to support. Is there like a, there's a thing, there's like a journalistic code where you can't tell. Yeah, Is that I don't know. I mean, we're not that? real journalists, so I kind of, you know, I kind of just said that I'm a Buttigieg guy, and I am. <laughs> I I really like him. Um, I I enjoyed today's conversation. I I think it's hopeful to hear about the willingness to invest in a publication that's new. It's a risky thing to do in this environment, right? I mean, we've seen a lot of publications go down, but given the uh, the team that they've assembled over there, I mean, protocol could be a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, well, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. I certainly enjoyed today's conversation. Um, if you enjoyed the conversation and you enjoy this podcast as much as we like doing it, what we would love for you to do is come on to wherever you found us, uh, leave us a comment, and rate us five stars. It helps more people find the podcast. Thanks.